Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, at the outset, uh, we apologize for a slight delay uh, to begin this webinar. We have the honor of extending a uh, warm welcome to all of you, uh, including our uh, executive body consisting of uh, our honorable chairperson, Dr. Adi Bhushan Pandey, sir, and our full-time members, Dr. Pravin Kumar Tiwari and Ma'am Smita Jingral. Today's webinar on firm-wide audit quality management with the theme, building high quality audit firms to you know, uh, highlight the need to focus on identifying and managing risks that could impact audit quality and how firms can create better quality systems by addressing their specific risks leading to more reliable audits. We have the privilege of uh, you know, having with us eminent speakers in CA Amitesh Dataji and CA Vardarajan Ji who will share their you know, knowledge, expertise, and valuable insights general scheme, which will surely help enhance audit practices. This webinar, uh, I would call upon the participants to serve serves more than just a platform for sharing information. We encourage you to raise questions and share your viewpoints on the chat box that we have. We will be taking a few questions after the presentation by our experts. Before we you know, take it forward, we extend our sincere gratitude to our executive body and our chairperson for guiding us in all our endeavors, including the conduct of this webinar. Now, uh, a small disclaimer we would like to give the views and opinions expressed today by our speakers and by our executive body uh, are not to be taken as the official stance of the organization they represent. Uh, I now have the uh, Honor and privilege of requesting our honorable chairperson, Dr. Ajay Bhushan Prasad Pandey, sir, to kindly set the tone by addressing us. Sir, okay. yeah, good afternoon. Uh, you know, my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Pravi Tiwari, Ismita Jinran, and also today the speakers, uh, Mr. Amitesh Datta, Mr. Bhadarajan, and my uh, for a team, Mr. Siam to the other company and and all those who, are, who have connected to us to this uh, webinar. I'm very thankful uh, to uh, all of you uh, who has organized this uh, webinar because uh, uh, the topic of this webinar is a uh, audit quality management firm wide audit quality management building high quality audit firms so what we need to stress on this is the entire objective of this entire exercise is that how we build high quality audit firms uh, you are already aware that uh, so far as our country is concerned, it is at the cusp of uh, the entire development cycle. If you see during the last few years, the kind of growth that we have seen and we have experienced and rather we have been a part of it is phenomenal. Be it uh, in terms of uh, creating a digital public infrastructure, be it uh, uh, the you know, the financial inclusion, social inclusion, the people participating in the capital market, and then even the industrial growth. You know, we have consistently over the last few years, despite COVID, we have, we, we recovered very fast and we have been showing the growth of uh, real growth in the real terms of about 7%. Now, with this and with all the other enablement in place, today we are approximately around fifth largest economy in the world, and soon we are going to become third largest economy. And there are estimates that uh, where our country will be in 2047. The one estimate says that somewhere around $28 trillion. Recently, our former chief economic advisor, Mr. Krishnamurti Subramaniam, who is currently the executive director in IMF, 
He has come out with a book, India at 2000, India at 100. And what he estimates that in 2047, our, the size of the economy will be somewhere around $55 trillion. So which is almost uh, double than, uh, you know, the, what the other estimate is. Uh, you know, the people can have a different views, but the, the fact remains that our economy size is going to be of that order. I mean, nobody can dispute that. Now, in this uh, situation that, you know, that we are going to be uh, a major player in the world economy, now, the question is that we cannot have, it's not a mathematical formula that, you know, you can assume 7% or 8% growth rate, and then, you know, you apply the rule of 72, that, you know, in X number of years, it will double, and then accordingly, you do that. You know, it, it wouldn't work that way. You know, we have to create some enabling uh, atmosphere that what is, what is that which will drive the country's growth and will take our country to that level of uh, the GDP, and how will we achieve this? Now, as I was saying in the beginning, that because of all this digital public infrastructure, the KYC, and then you know the people are able to uh, you know uh, transact digitally, have the KYC, the people are able to open a bank account, people are uh, do KYC, open DMAT account, mutual fund portfolio. So the whole nation is now India has become. Earlier, the people used to save their money in the cash or in the gold or, or in the uh, fixed deposit. But now they are actually participating in the capital market. This is a very good thing. And so therefore not only, uh, you know, the foreign institutional investor or the domestic institutional investors, the retail investors are also participating in a very, very big way. And this participation, if you compare the numbers, of the DMAT account, what it was five years ago, it used to be around three to four crores. And today the total number of DMAT account is about 15 crores. Out of that, about 10 crores are the active DMAT, DMAT account. The people are actually participating in this. So we have become a, from the nation of savers to now nation of investors. Now in this scenario, and so therefore the people are going to put money in the capital market, in the economy, and, and that is how the growth will be driven. But the question here is that can we take that phenomena for granted? So we have seen in the past and also seen uh, there are many examples around the world that you know the one setback in the uh, capital market actually it uh, drags that country by several you know maybe uh, one decade or even more than that. We have seen that. Let's say what happened at the time of dot com burst, or you know when the Enron broke out, or uh, I'm talking about you know the non-economic phenomena. I mean, supposing if there is a global financial crisis, it's a different thing, right? But the question here is that you know even if let's say if the economy is and other uh, other factors are fine, but you know, the one or two big corporate failures or these scams actually make people lose trust. And when the people start losing trust, then, you know, it wouldn't take time for the investors to uh, retreat and go back. And then, you know, that is what, you know, it will, uh, it is going to uh, set the entire, our development cycle back by maybe uh, at least a decade. This is what I would uh, uh, say that. The question here is that how do we ensure that our corporate governance standards are, you know, are, are top of the line and are, are among the best in the world? Because we are saying we're going to become third largest economy and we are going to remain there. Then our corporate governance standards are also should be of that level. Now, this corporate governance standard, if you say, there are several institutions, several, several regulations, you know, the Companies Act, and then you have a SEBI LODR, and plus, you know, several other economic legislations. What today, what we are going to focus on is a very, very essential element. That is the, uh, you know, the high quality reporting framework and also high quality auditing framework. 
and it is this auditing framework that is why that is where this role of SQM becomes very very important. We have seen you know that during the last five six seven years, while on one hand we have shown a very good growth, but about during the last about one decade or so, we have seen a series of corporate failures. You know I need not name them. In fact, many of them we have dealt in. Uh, you know, NFRA has dealt them. You know, many of those case studies, many of our orders are on the web, uh, on the website. You know, the, some major scams that we have dealt dealt with during the last two years, and which happened during the last about seven years, is about more than two lakh crores. You know, the total money. You know, I mean, the people lost, either the uh, investor lost, or the stakeholders lost, or the banks lost. The total amount is so much. And when those things happened, that time the people were very, very shaky. And then, you know, they lost trust in this entire capital market. So we don't want that situation to be repeated. Now, how do we ensure that? And that is why, you know, our focus from the NFI side has been that on one hand, you know, we should have a fairly high quality reporting standards. And at the same time, we should have a very high quality you know, the auditing framework. And this SQM is a very, very integral part of this. Now, if you look at the history of SQM, it is the, like a next generation of SQC, SQC1. If you see SQC1 history, you know, uh, it, certain changes were brought in in SQC and then, you know, till about 2009, there were a lot of changes were made, right? Uh, like, you know, many places there were, you know, the confusion of language that, uh, and, the, and that is where, you know, the many of the words were replaced by, you know, mandatory language, you know, the suit got replaced by SAP, right? But after 2009, you know, as the things have changed around the world, the, uh, you know, IASB has come out with SQM1 and SQM2. And essentially what it does say that SQM2 focuses on the uh, EQCR and SQC, SQM1 would largely focus on the, the firm wide, uh, the entire, the quality and uh, quality. Actually, this is extremely important because, you know, when the audit is done and particularly of the public interest entity, which is very, very large, you know, it can't be a job of, you know, one engagement partner or maybe an engagement team consisting of two, three people, right? And that is where the uh, understanding has to be that it is a highly complex exercise. And that is very, very critical because that is, is very uh, extremely necessary for ensuring good corporate governance and also building trust for the true and fair statement, the financial statement. So those things should be coming there. Now, in this particular case, uh, you know, even though the SQC uh, was uh, kind of replaced by SQM and that became effective all around the world in 2022, in our country, we don't even have the version of 2009 that, you know, the previous version. You know, we are still, you know, largely uh, at the level of 2002 version. So why are we lagging by two decades? I mean, I mean, on one hand, we say that, you know, we are, uh, you know, we are, we are progressing very fast and so and so. But then, you know, our standards are almost, you know, lagging by two, uh, uh, you know, the two, uh, uh, you know, the two decades back. And also, you know, I, when I talk to the, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the CA uh, chartered accountants community, and also, you know, within the government, there is a there is a strong desire that why can't we have some homegrown, you know, the big, big uh, auditing firms and uh, you know accountant uh, accountancy and auditing firms. You know we have shown that in a different field. I mean, take example of IT information technology. Till about uh, maybe four years, uh, the four decades back. You know we did not have you know uh, you know the strong Indian uh, IT company. But today we have uh, many uh, uh, IT company, Infosys, TCS, you know, L, uh, you know, the Wipro and, uh, uh, you know, the Mindtree, Tech Mahindra, a number of them 
which have made their mark in the uh, in the entire world. Everybody knows about that, and they have established their reputation. Similarly, you know many other fields. For example, you know the LNT. Take example of LNT. You know it's a construction firm, and just see the the, the name that they have earned for themselves. So why can't we do it for the auditing firms? So what exactly, what is essentially required that you cannot dream of creating a world size, you know, the world level, global level auditing firm with a standard, which is not a global standard. I mean, it can't be that, that, you know, you don't follow a global standard and then say, Ki, we will create a global firm. I mean, this is something, you know, the people have to be, and then the entire uh, uh, you know, the uh, CA community and then with government and everyone has to understand that. That the first prerequisite of uh, creating a global firm is the global standard, right? I mean, we cannot very conveniently say that, uh, you know, the, what we are doing is the best. You know, that is something which will be very, very myopic view. And we need to, uh, we need to accept this. You know, uh, you must have heard the, uh, you know, the proverb that the best enemy of good. But, uh, you know, the converse is also equally true that the good is always the enemy of the best. Because many times, you know, we are satisfied that, you know, this is good. And therefore, you know, we should not uh, strive for the best. And if you are not going to strive for the best, how would we, uh, you know, become a global uh, player in this field? And that is why it is absolutely necessary that we should have this. Now, you know, in fact, you know, now that we are discussing, and that is why, you know, from the NFRA side, we want that all these standards should be adopted as early as possible. We can't afford to lag, you know, the two decades. I can understand two years, three years, four years, right? In fact, we should be the leader in, 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 uh, leader in those things. But what is happening is uh, that we are lagging by two decades. And I'm not sure that if we don't do anything, then maybe, you know, maybe we'll have to wait for another decade or so. So this is something, you know, should be, you know, I mean, is this a very happy situation? So that is why I want to, you know, rake your brain, right? We rake your brain. And this is a very, very frank talk that we are, we are mentioning this. Another very important aspect is that, you know, the SQM, you know, it should be issued as a, as a you know, the standards. Because, you know, if it remains as a policy, then, you know, there, you know, we have the, uh, you know, the entire, uh, you know, we have, uh, uh, you know, many uh, disputes uh, which go on. And therefore, there are people to exploit certain deficiencies saying that, you know, if you look, if it is a policy, then whether the policy, uh, uh, you know, uh, the adherence, what will be the value of uh, that policy? Can somebody be, uh, uh, you know, uh, mandated to follow this policy? So that is why there are many countries in the world. You know, the Australia is one example where they have used the SQM as their auditing standard. And in, in the other countries, even if it is a policy, but then their law actually recognizes those policy as a binding standards. So that is another thing that we want to uh, ensure that these uh, SQMs are become the integral part of the auditing standards. You know, recently you must have heard, uh, you know, must have uh, 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 noticed that, uh, you know, our desire to, you know, incorporate best of the global standards is driven, of course, by the fact that, you know, we want to become a major global player, but also our honorable prime minister you know, about a few months back, you know, he uh, he publicly said that we must ensure that we adhere to global standards. And that was discussed in the union cabinet in the month of July this year. And the cabinet secretary of India, he issued a circular saying that whenever any cabinet proposal are made, you know, you must give a, uh, you know, analysis as to to whatever proposal that you are making, how does it compare with, you know, the global standards? And if there are deviation, then what are the reasons for this? So as a country, you know, this, you know, the political leadership, the government, you know, everyone is now, you know, the fully on board for 
adopting the global standards. And then the reason is that, you know, we are third largest economy, right? And we cannot, in terms of the standard, we cannot be sub-standard. You know, we have to have the global standards. And that is why you must have noticed that the last month, you know, we, uh, uh, we, we came out with the exposure draft for SA 600. Now the SA 600, the existing one, they're of 2002 vintage. And how do you, uh, you know, go into this, uh, you know, the 21st century, you know, one of the uh, top uh, league, you know, with this, uh, uh, you know, the 2002 vintage of uh, auditing standards. And that is why, and in fact, and then what is that the problem that we found? The problem was that the responsibility and accountability of the principal auditor was quite hazy, was very uncertain, and in a particularly in a uh, you know in a group companies where there are a large number of subsidiaries, the principal auditor was not taking the responsibility, whereas the shareholders were under the impression saying that yes, you know, the principal auditor is giving true and fair certificate and therefore, you know, he must have, you know, uh, taken necessary measures to ensure that the accounts are true and fair. But, you know, beneath that, there was a reliance which uh, was, uh, you know, the way the SSC was being missing, uh, you know, I would say that it was actually being misinterpreted to a certain extent. And that was the reason why, you know, I mean, if you see many of these corporate failures that took place during our proceedings, and it is there in our orders that, you know, when we asked the auditor of the principal, uh, uh, principal auditor of the group company, they said that, you know, as per such and such paragraph so and so, we relied upon the work done by the other auditors. I mean, this was not a correct understanding, and that is why we have also issued a circular. So the, see, if you see our, uh, you know, our goal of doing all, all these exercises, key, whether it is exposure draft of SA 600 or issuing a circular or, you know, this SQM, you know, the, our desire is to conform to the global standards, right? And let the, uh, you know, the good not be the enemy of best. So I will stop here and I have, uh, you know, my colleagues also uh, 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 would also express their uh, views here. And I'm very thankful to both, uh, you know, uh, the uh, Amitesh Datta and Vardarajan who have agreed to come here and then talk about this. And uh, so uh, this kind of a discussion definitely gives more clarity because, you know, many times the people have a lot of doubts saying that, you know, the, uh, because last week I was in Bombay and addressing the uh, Bombay Chartered Accountant Society. So they had, you know, some of them had, you know, some apprehension as to that, what will happen when the SA 600 comes, you know, how will the responsibility? My answer was like this, that we are not doing something, you know, very, very unique. You know, this, uh, you know, the SA 600, for example, has been implemented across most of the countries in the world. So whatever problem that we are finding, that, you know, key groups having the subsidy, and then, you know, the subsidy is being listed and so and so, many of these problems have already been handled, uh, you know, elsewhere. So, in fact, in that sense, because, you know, we are joining the bandwagon a little late, we also have the advantage of the experience of the whole global experience. So, similarly, in case of an SQM also, we will have the experience. And, if, and the final takeaway should be that, you know, we cannot create a global size, you know, the global audit firm without adhering to the global standard. So I will stop here and then I will uh, look forward to listening from all of you. My only uh, request would be that around uh, 4.30, you know, 4.15, I will have to leave because there is another meeting. So till then I will be here, participate here. And then, uh, so I will be benefited by your, uh, you know, your views. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, we, once again, you know, once again, you know, you know, the importance of embracing the global standards and best practices. Thank you very much. Uh, we have the uh, privilege of requesting our full-time member, Dr. Kavin Kumar Tiwari, sir, to share his views and address us. Sir.
good afternoon everybody am i audible yes sir you are audible sir okay uh i would i would like to start my uh, address with a quote from edward deming who famously said that quality is everyone's responsibility this highlights the collective commitment required to uphold quality and profession our chairman has adequately dealt with the importance of quality standards uh, in the arena where we are working i would only like to add that you know uh, under the uh, article 4 consultation the international monetary fund they make a periodic assessment of uh, each member country's um, standards and codes and uh, to my knowledge at the moment there are 13 standards and codes on which there is a formal assessment by the international monetary fund and the auditing and accounting standards are part of these so in addition to the regions uh, uh, chairman uh, enumerated why we should be following the international standards this is also one of the regions we should fall in line with international standards because the assessments of the imf impact each countries um, in 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 many many ways including its international reputation now uh, chairman has already made this point that isq more was introduced by the iaasp in uh, 2022 Uh, it reflects a more holistic approach to quality management, specifically addressing risks that could affect investors. Inadequate quality management could lead to significant audit failures, resulting in financial losses for the investors. We are all aware of the scandal involving Arthur Anderson in in the beginning of this century, which resulted in the firm's dissolution. it highlighted how inadequate quality controls can lead to catastrophic failures the collapse of lehman brothers in 2008 was partly attributed to the failure of their auditors to identify and report on significant financial irregularities more recently the audit failures at the wirecard in germany reveal systemic issues within the auditing process leading to massive fraud that cost the investors billions as warren buffett famously said it takes 20 years to build reputation and 5 minutes to ruin it if you think about that you will do things differently unquote this is especially true in the audit profession where the stakes are high and reputation is everything if a firm fails to uh, detect material misstatements in financial statements the investors may make decisions based on misleading information as peter drucker once said quality in service or product is not what you put into it it is what the customers get out of it today's uh, uh, today's speakers will dwell Uh, in detail on different aspects of the quality management let me highlight a few key elements that i think are very imp- important uh tone at the top one of the critical components of the iskm1 is the concept of tone at the top when leadership prioritizes quality it filters down through all levels encouraging staff to adhere to high standards and ensuring that the importance of quality It resonates to the form. In the Indian context, the adoption of ISKM One is particularly significant, given the rapid evolution of the regulatory landscape and the increasing complexity of business operations. This alignment is crucial for enhancing the credibility of financial reporting and restoring investor confidence. NAFRA's orders in the last two years. adequately highlight the need to address corporate governance challenges and for the audit firms to bring their quality control systems up to the international standards uh in conclusion uh, i would like to say that by focusing on strong quality control systems emphasizing on the tone at the top identifying potential risk and adopting a proactive risk based approach 
the firms can significantly enhance the quality of their audits and in turn protect the interest of the investors. Uh, to conclude, I would again uh, quote from John F. Kennedy, who said that the time to repair the roof is when the sun is shining. This is a call to action for all of us in the audit profession to prioritize quality management now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for sharing your view that uh, in highlighting the importance of uh, protecting public interest and the audit quality. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a uh, great pleasure in uh, requesting our full time member, uh, Ma'am Smita Jibran, to kindly address us by sharing our views. Ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Tonk. And a very good afternoon to all our listeners in this webinar. Uh, we all know that internationally, the SQM1, which is the subject of today's webinar, was to be was adopted by 15th of December 1922. We in India are still in the process. Our chairperson and member have already uh, spoken about this topic and introduced it. And then we have our eminent speakers, Mr. Datta and Mr. Vardarajan, who would be detailing this topic for your benefit. Let me just give a little bit about my two cents about this topic. You see, actually, ISQM1 actually deals with the firm's responsibility to put in place a complete system of quality management. It is not as if we did not have quality earlier. We had SQC, that is the quality control standard, but we are now transiting to ISQM1. So what is the what is the difference in this transition? Typically, it is a transition from policies and procedures that address standalone elements to an integrated quality management approach, which would actually permeate the system as a whole. So that is what SQM1 uh, stands for. That's why the move shift from the word quality control to quality management. ISQM1 actually has got eight uh, interrelated uh, components, which are iterative and integrated. The standard of control earlier had six. I think they added risk and maybe information and communication. I'm sure the speakers will speak more about it. But what is central to this, these eight uh, components, I think the most important one, and member Tiwari has already spoken about it, is governance and leadership. So let me say a couple of sentences about governance and leadership. Why is governance and leadership so important? As we said, the tone at the top. If you have a strong governance and leadership adhering to quality, you're going to see it permeate to all levels. And when I talk about permeating to all levels, I don't mean just the levels in the HR system, that every level of manpower in your organization. It actually permeates all systems, processes, and the culture of the organization as a whole. When you talk of org culture, you know, embracing quality and having it as a system as a whole, you're going to look at it and enforce it every aspect, right at the time of acceptance, at the time of planning the audit, at the time of strategic decision making, at the time of execution, you're going to involve um, quality in continuous um, you know, appraisal of the work of your uh, staff and your uh, auditors. Also, the collective responsibility. Tone at the top means the management owns responsibility collectively with each person in the organization. All of this will lead to quality audits. Quality audits will lead to quality financial statements, and that's what we are all here for. Before I conclude, I want to just read out. When I was reading on this topic. I found one very nice sentence, which kind of says it all. Uh, when I'm talking of governance and leadership, the central of the eight components. Governance and leadership is of paramount importance to quality management at the firm and engagement level, because it is the way in which the firm embeds its culture and ethics and self-regulates and serves as a framework for how the firm's decisions are made. A firm's governance also affects the public perception of the firm. So important. So let me conclude by saying that ISQM1 is a fundamental shift on the way we approach quality, placing leadership 
management and leadership at the forefront. I hope this webinar will be useful to all of you. And uh, I want to be really appreciate our two speakers who have joined us on this webinar. Thank you. Ma'am, thank you very much uh, for sharing your views, uh, you know, on the shift from quality control to quality management, and also highlighting the importance of governance and leadership. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm also joined by our esteemed colleague in NAPRA, our principal consultant, Mr. Vidyadar Kulkarni. I now request him to kindly, uh, you know, give a brief introduction of our eminent speakers for this webinar. Kulkarni. Uh, thank you, Shamji. Uh, I'm really privileged and honored to introduce the, our uh, you know expert speaker today on this uh, very 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 important uh, topic, a critical topic, uh, uh, you know uh, at this juncture of our uh, uh, India's progress and development. Um, like our uh, chairperson uh, mentioned, uh, really the importance of the you know standards and codes uh, in India. We need to have them of the you know, highest quality comparable to the you know, global standards. So today we have uh, uh, two uh, you know, eminent speakers. Uh, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, one is uh, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Amitesh Datta. Um, he is a chartered accountant with uh, over three uh, decades of uh, you know, practical experience of auditing, and uh, he is a uh, you know, partner with. Uh, uh, partner uh, price for uh, um, uh, and affiliates and uh, he has uh, played a key role in uh, transforming uh, driving transformation uh, and innovation in the audit and audit quality uh, in their uh, you know in their firm and uh, he has uh, plenty of experience in uh, uh, you know uh, performing uh, the audits of mncs and domestic listed companies etc uh, uh, involving uh, you know, both the Indian GAAP and the IFRS and US GAAP, uh, a wealth of experience in the auditing field. And uh, with him, uh, you know, uh, you know um, uh, I'm pleased to welcome his uh, a colleague, Mr. Bhardarajan, who is uh, also a, a chartered accountant and partner with Pricewaterhouse and uh, an experience, wealth of experience of over uh, 30 years uh, uh, in that firm. And uh, more importantly, uh, his role actually is that of a uh, you know uh, leading the quality systems of quality management within the firm. Uh, so uh, in that uh, uh, you know, field, I can say that uh, uh, he has a really a hands-on experience across all the various components of the you know uh, the ISQM. Uh, and uh, like uh, you know, uh, uh, everyone says. Uh, it is important that one should hear from the horse's mouth. Uh, so uh, let's now, it's really our privilege uh, at NFRA to you know, welcome uh, you know, these uh, uh, expert speakers uh, who are actually uh, living this, uh, these standards uh, you know, 24 by 7 in their day-to-day -day, you know, functioning. Uh, so now, without uh, you know, taking away much of uh, their time, so now I you know with uh, you know, with the brief introduction, I also welcome them and uh, I request uh, Mr. Dattaji and Varadarajan to take over the, you know, session. What do you want to do? Amitaji, over to you. Varadarajan? Yeah. Yeah, I think, uh... Mitesh will start. I'll, I'll just join in. So I think Amitesh is having some connectivity issues. So, uh, so let me, uh, let me start. Uh, so I'm just putting up my presentation.
Uh, so, uh, so, so thank you very much for giving us this opportunity to, uh, to, to share our uh, experience with the implementation of ISQM1. Uh, uh, as, uh, as was said earlier, uh, this is a, is a, is a, is a, is a big change from the existing uh, SQC1, which uh, I think most of us are are, are are aware of uh, and the thing is also about uh, uh, I think some of us who uh, practice uh, audit uh, have probably already implemented uh, the requirements of ISQM1 for the reason that uh, I think one of the requirements of ISQM1 is that uh, we need to uh, uh, to make sure that whenever one issues uh, any report under IAASB standards, uh, the requirement is that we, 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 we comply with the ISQM1 standards. So to that extent, uh, many of the colleagues who are probably uh, attending this uh, webinar today uh, would have uh, had experience to implement in their own organizations uh, if they are complying with the IAASB uh, the standards as as they issue out uh, 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 opinions. Uh, so, Amitesh, are you back? Uh, okay. So, I think the way we have structured is uh, that we will try and cover uh, some of the the basic aspects around. Okay. Uh, I'm back. Brother, I'm back. back. Yeah. I'm so sorry. I was having connectivity issues. At the best of times, the Wi-Fi seems to be playing up. Uh, so thank you, thank you, uh, Kulkarniji, for that introduction. And uh, sorry for this delay. I hopefully the Wi-Fi will hold and will be stable. Uh, let me start by saying that I think uh, between the three members of NFRA, I think you've summarized the ISQM one very well. Uh, I think the main points that we were going to stress on, I think the the entire context has been laid out beautifully. And all we now need to do probably is is you know just talk through it and emphasize a few of the points which were actually spoken about in terms of what is really critical in understanding these standards. Yeah, Varda, can you just move on? Yeah, okay. So as, as we've said, uh, um, am I audible? Uh, Shamji, am I fully audible? Yes, you are very much audible. Please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm just checking so that the, you know, if I'm not audible, just maybe just send a message and then I'll try again if the Wi-Fi plays up. So sorry for this. Okay. So, so I think we've been talking about ISQM1. The theme for today is building high quality audit firms. And ISQM1 is absolutely center stage. And it actually tells us what is it that we need to consider in building that high quality audit firm. But I think it's also important to talk, to bring into perspective the other two quality standards which are there internationally and globally, which is also used is ISQM2, which is on engagement quality reviews and appointment of the engagement quality control reviewer, which is at the engagement quality review level. And then finally at the engagement level, which is quality management at the engagement level, which is ISA 220 revised. It is the suit of three standards together, which actually sets the benchmark for the quality that is required emanating from the quality that one needs to build at the firm level, which then permeates right across the organization, the audit firm. And it also then manifests itself in when the individual audits are done or reviews are done or financial statements. So, so all these three actually taken together enable that. Today, of course, we are going to talk about ISQM, one. Yeah. Okay, just a little bit of background. Uh, you know, I know that uh, we spoke about public interest, and I think it's very important to understand that when the standard setters were looking at the public interest, ISQM 1 actually it tries to respond to some of these public interest matters in a big way. So, what you see on this slide, so for example, the first one. One would say it's a given, right? An auditor needs to have an independent, challenging, and skeptical mindset while performing the audits or reviews of financial statement. Actually, this is one of the public interest matter that was taken into consideration. If you go into the basis for conclusion for ISQM1, 
you will find all of these matters that actually took center stage when they were thinking about how to actually develop the entire system of quality management in ISQM1. The second one also very important, keeping the ISAs and the quality, quality standards fit for purpose. Uh, we spoke about how the international standards are there. This was introduced in December 2022. There is a draft exposure standard SQM1 in India as well, which was there last year. So it is also important that these standards are kept fit for purpose, including the quality standards and the auditing standard. The another aspect which it brought about, and again, uh, my earlier speakers, they alluded to this, it is an overall system of quality management, both at the firm level as well as at the engagement level. The other aspect which, which this standard brought in and one of the public interest matters which was there is exploring the concept of transparency and its role in audit quality. So some of you may be aware that in some jurisdictions, there are these transparency reports that audit firms take out. And it is in this context that we need to think about the, 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 the requirement to have transparency reports and what role will it have to play in audit quality in India as well. The last one, the second last one is of course talking about the entire monitoring and remediation activities that are very important, both internal and external around performing quality audits. We'll talk about that a little bit today as well, because this is one of the components of ISQM1. And then finally, of course, the entire piece on robust communication and interactions during the audit. And all of these were actually the public interest matters that were considered in actually drafting and framing the new ISQM1 that we have today, which we, which we need to apply at the firm level for quality. So I actually thought I'll put up this. This was very recently, uh, you know, the PCOB chair came out with this comment and it kind of is similar to what Dr. Pandeji was also talking about. Ultimately, it's about investor confidence. And when you look at this comment and when you go back to the overall objective of ISQM1, actually there is a correlation because when you sit back, you might think I need to do an audit at the engagement level. How is quality at the firm level important for me to render a, a high quality audit at the engagement level? Because I might say, okay, if I am complying with auditing standards, if I'm complying with accounting standards, I am doing an audit, which is a high quality audit at the firm level. However, if you don't have that level of high quality at the firm level, one could question and say that, will you be able to do that audit consistently at that level of quality? Because it is when you have these quality standards and these quality objectives at the firm level that there will be consistency in every engagement of audit or review of a financial statement that is done by an audit firm. And it will ensure that it is there every time that an audit opinion is actually issued by that firm on a set of financial statements. And that actually takes you back to the very simple overall objective that is there in ISQM1. Essentially, it says it focuses on designing, implementing, and operating a system of quality management for all the audits or reviews that an audit firm does to ensure that there is reasonable assurance that the professional standards, the legal and regulatory framework will be followed and adhered to for every engagement. And the audit reports will also be appropriate for those same circumstances. So it's a very simple two clauses in ISKM1, which drives the entire focus of this risk-based approach, which you see on this, on this slide. And that is where this entire concept of shift, shifting from quality control to quality management comes in. Essentially, quality control was about being reactive having a set of policies and procedures and not really being proactive. Quality management and having a system of quality management all across the firm is more about being proactive, having a more overall holistic and a more comprehensive approach to the system of quality management and implementing them across the firm on a very consistent basis. Yeah, well, go ahead.
So is it moving for you? Uh, yes, I'm moving the slides here. I'm going to talk about the, the, the structures and components. Yeah, am I audible? Yes. yes. Sorry, am I audible? Yeah. Yeah, you are. We are able to see you, but you are audible. I think he has some. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Can so you can you can continue. Yeah. You can Okay, are you guys able to hear me? Uh, maybe yeah. I can take it over. Yeah. Okay, we so, so yeah. yeah, so yeah. principally, uh, uh, I think uh, it was also talking, just spoken about of uh, there being eight components. Uh, so there are these eight components uh, which are intertwined, and they uh, operate in a in a pretty coordinated manner. I think I think that's the 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 expectation as to how a robust. Uh, uh, quality management uh, can be set up uh, at a client level. Uh, I think there are two processes, which is the, the risk assessment process and the monitoring and remediation process. So these uh, are more uh, processes uh, and, and not uh, the individual activities, as you may want to call it. Uh, uh, so, so, so that's one. And at the center of it uh, is all uh, the governance uh, and, and the leadership uh, that we, we, we talked about. In addition uh, to these components, uh, there are certain other requirements also under the standard. Uh, I think one of it is, uh, is around uh, assigning roles and responsibilities to various individuals, uh, uh, having uh, appropriate documentation of your system of quality management, uh, uh, and, and uh, I think many of the firms uh, may actually be part of uh, networks uh, or they may be using the services of uh, third parties uh, as regards uh, provision of their service. Uh, so the, the quality management not only uh, 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 focuses on the eight components, but also with regard to some of these other requirements so that as and when uh, there is uh, there is an evaluation that happens or even if there is a third party one is able to demonstrate that the quality management itself is uh, is, is is holistic um, so uh, moving on when we talk about the eight yeah Vanda, Vanda, i'm back sorry i'm so sorry, sorry. maybe i'll maybe okay. i'll take it from here okay yeah, if you so, can. yeah yeah thanks thanks so again so we spoke about the the eight components uh, which go into ISQM one, and as Varda was explaining in the earlier side, they are actually all they are an iterative process. They are integrated with one another, and they are also interconnected. So if you look at this left hand side of this slide, you see those eight components. Today we are going to focus on three of them. Uh, the first one, the firm's risk assessment process. The second one, governance and leadership. And finally, the last one, which is the monitoring and and remediation process. And we will also touch on the information and communication bit to a, to a certain extent. So on this slide, let me briefly explain about the others because the, those three, as I said, we will go into a little bit more detail and we will talk about it. What is relevant ethical requirements? What does it mean in the context of building a high quality firm? Essentially what ISQM1 says is that you need to have quality objectives such that engagements are performed adhering to the relevant independence and ethical standards. So the partners and, 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 the, and the personnel who perform the audits, they will need to adhere to the applicable ind independence and ethical standards. And that is something which will be need to set up at the firm level and will have to flow through also at the individual engagement level. 
If you look at number four, which talks about acceptance and continuance of client relationships. Again, this is a very important aspect because ISQM one says that firms need to apply appropriate judgment in accepting or continuing with a client. And what is that judgment based on? And, and the standard actually says that that judgment typically would be based on the culture, the behavior, the ethical values that are present in the client that we are auditing. So if those are appropriate, if those are of high quality, if corporate governance is of high quality, that is when the judgment needs to be applied in terms of accepting a client or continuing with a client or vice versa. The fifth one that you see here is on engagement performance. On engagement performance, again, this goes to the core of actually performing an audit or a review. What ISQM1 says is that a system of quality management needs to be designed, implemented, and operated such that every time that an engagement is, an audit engagement is performed, the nature, timing, extent of direction, supervision, and review of that engagement is consistently applied as per the professional standards. Similarly, it talks about audit documentation, which needs to be done in a timely manner. Then it also talks about archival which also needs to follow the auditing standards for archival and needs to follow document retention rules, which are applicable in each territory. Then when you come to number six, which is resources, ISKM one talks about it in the context of quality objectives for human resources, technological resources, intellectual resources, and it also goes on to talk about if service providers are used for either human resources, technological resources, or intellectual resources, you will need to make sure that you have an overall system of quality management across each one of these resources that are used for performing an audit. Information and communication, we'll talk about a little bit. It deals with both external and, uh, and, and internal communication, and we will talk about that as well as monitoring and remediation process. So when you look at this, the firm's risk assessment process, which is really the risk-based approach that ISKM1 talks about, that is the process that needs to be done to design, implement, and operate a system of quality management. The governance and leadership is actually the piece which will, which will essentially provide the environment. It will provide the environment in which the system of quality management will actually function. That's as, as it was rightly put, that is really the base. That is really the base, and we will also talk about that a little bit more in detail. And then you have certain enablers, as I said, like engagement performance, resources, and information and communication. So as you can see, all of them are interconnected. They are interrelated. You can't separate one from the other. And all of them have to be implemented in its entirety to actually have a high-quality audit firm as laid down under ISQM 1. Further. Okay, so as I said, we'll, we'll dive a little deeper into three of these. The first one of that is the firm's risk assessment process. Again, ISPM 1 talks about a risk-based approach. If you look at the process, which is there in the bottom part of the slide, you need to establish quality objectives at the firm level. Those quality objectives are specified in ISPM 1. Once those quality objectives are specified, the firm will need to go ahead and identify the risks in achieving those quality objectives. And those are called the quality risks. These are the risks in achieving those quality objectives. And we'll talk about quality risk also a little bit more in detail. Once those quality risks are identified, then the firm will then need to design and implement appropriate responses to mitigate those quality risks so that the quality objectives can be achieved. And hence, you will build a high quality audit firm. And then, of course, the final box is where this is not a one off process. It's not a one time process. It is iterative. It is continuous. You need keep need. You keep adding risks. You may delete risks if they're not relevant anymore. You keep modifying the responses and ultimately you make it fit for purpose for that particular point in time. Yeah. Okay, so quality risk. What really is a, is a quality risk? Quality risk is essentially any risk 
that will adversely impact the achievement of the quality objective. It is essentially how events, conditions, actions, or for that matter, even inactions could actually adversely affect the achievement of quality obje uh, objectives. So once you've ascertained what are those quality risks, you've identified what are those quality risks, those quality risks will need to be then assessed. And how do you assess it? Essentially, you go through a, uh, a, a case of what you say is whether those risks have a reasonable possibility of occurring, whether individually, each of those quality risks, or in combination with other risks, they have a reasonable possibility of occurring such that the quality objectives that, that, the, that the firm is required to uh, follow for rendering an audit or delivering an audit is not achieved. So in substance, essentially the quality risk is the risk that you will not achieve the quality objective. And it is very important that each audit firm which performs audit or reviews of financial statement identifies those quality risks upfront so that they know what are the risks which are there in delivering a high quality audit at every point in time. Yeah. Okay, so once you've identified quality risks, the firm will then also need to design and implement responses to address those quality risks such that those risks are mitigated. Now, what does this mean? Let me take an example. Let's say there are new professional standards. Let's say there are, you know, new circulars. So Dr. Pandey was talking about the latest circular on SA 600. Now, once these come in, the firm will actually need to consider how to actually address that quality risk of not being able to comply or not being able to adhere with that new professional pronouncement, or let's say in this case, that particular circular. That will need to be built in. Adequate responses will need to be built in to mitigate the quality risk that that particular new standard or new circular is not adhered to or not complied with while performing a audit engagement where, of course, that is relevant. So that is one example. If I was to take another example, which is on this slide, which talks about use of service providers. There are actually a number of, of uh, Mr. Vajrajan, can you please uh, take it forward, please? Yeah. So actually, I think he was. Sorry, I think uh, Amitesh, you are. A number of. Uh, Uh, so I think he was talking about uh, the another example of a service. Am I still audible? I think you went off, uh, Amitesh. I think you have a Wi-Fi serious issue. Okay. So, uh, so I think we were talking about some examples. Uh, I know uh, at at times uh, uh, the audit firms use service providers. Uh, say, for instance, uh, you may actually be. Uh, using a service provider for storing your uh, archived files, for instance, right? So you need to be sure as to uh, whether uh, appropriate controls are in place, even at the service provider level, so that you you are able Is to comply with the requirements of the standards. Uh, so so to that extent, uh, I think it's, it's it's important that the the all potential quality risks uh, are identified uh, and are addressed uh, as, 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 as one uh, response. Um, so let me just uh, go further. So principally what uh, the, the standard requires is that, uh, that you need to do a risk assessment uh, at least uh, annually, uh, but for every change in an event or as, as and when a new event occurs, you will have to evaluate how uh, uh, that impacts uh, your, uh, your your risk assessment and is there any specific response that you need to talk about. Right? One example, uh, again, Amitesh spoke about was with regard to the circular that has come in. 
which would mean that uh, the the firms will have to evaluate as to the way that they are presently approaching some of the group uh, audit engagements, whether that needs to undergo a change, uh, considering the, the 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 expectations that are set out uh, as part of the the circular, right? So this is something which has to be proactive, uh, and one needs to always look at are there any other potential risks that are there uh, that needs to be addressed. Another example could be a new new standard on, on ESG, uh, which is out there, or people have started rendering ESG assurance services, uh, which are covered within the permit, the, 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 the overall aspect around uh, uh, provision of assurance services. So one would need to look at uh, all of that. Uh, I know we will talk about uh, the, the remediation uh, of deficiencies separately, uh, uh, because that also feeds in uh, to, to potentially identify risks uh, that may have been identified as part of the monitoring process that a firm has that will again will have to be evaluated and uh, uh, maybe baked in as part of your risk assessment procedures. So, so this becomes a cycle uh, uh, of, of one identifying risks, you have responses, you have monitoring and remediation uh, process which may identify deficiencies. Uh, which may result into identification of additional risks, which you need to address. So, so this is a, is a cycle which which continues. So, uh, so these are some examples that we thought uh, are examples of risks that one may have. Uh, uh, say, for example, we have ESG, which requires certain additional independence compliances. Uh, if you are getting into provision of ESG services, for instance. For you to be in a position to uh, provide those services, you need to have people who are who have the necessary skills. Uh, that would mean uh, that you will have to assess whether you have the right set of people to be in a position to deliver a quality uh, 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 assurance uh, engagement on that. Uh, I think as we talk, many of the uh, the firms also use uh, uh, various tools. Uh, there are bots that one uses. Again, those also come up, come with uh, their own uh, 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 risks to of of something not uh, uh, it doesn't really come out with the right output. Uh, so that would mean that it needs to be tested appropriately. Uh, so the accuracy, reliability, output integrity checks, and all of that. So all of that will also have to be tested. So those will be the kind of responses that you will have once you potentially get into uh, some of this uh, in terms of getting into uh, 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 putting out bots. Uh, the other example that we had was around uh, merger, merger of firms. When, when firms merge, each will have different cultures, each may have different kind of uh, processes, policies, uh, and suddenly you have uh, resources who start to work together, uh, which may result into to, to potential gaps and something may fall in between. So these are aspects, these are risks that one may, may have to actually consider uh, as one looks into to merging with another firm uh, so that you 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 cover that uh, as, as part of your appropriate uh, responses. COVID was another one. I know we've dealt with it. Uh, I know we probably got through with that with, with various changes uh, to, to, to the way uh, one would respond. Uh, the well, other I, can, has... I can I can take this. Yeah, please, please. Okay. Yeah. All right. So on governance and leadership, I think as was being spoken earlier, this is absolutely critical. This will provide the entire foundation for ISQM one to work and for high quality audit firms to be even created. If this is not there, if this is not existent, the other seven components is not going to work. Right. This is really the environment. This is really the enabler. And it's interconnected to everything else on around the seven components for them to work in a seamless manner and for for an audit firm to actually build a high quality audit firm. Now, if you look at this slide, it talks about some things which are given in the standard. So, for example, leadership needs to be responsible and accountable for quality. What does that mean? That basically means that they will need to set the tone at the top. They will need to set the quality, the culture and the behavior essentially of professional ethics, values, attitudes, 
having a consultation culture for difficult and contentious matters, all of that will need to be set as a base, will need to be set as a foundation for any audit firm to be able to build on that and deliver high quality audits. Once that is built, what that will also do is that will clearly permeate down to the personnel who are also involved in the audit, be it the partners or the other staff that are involved in the audits on the engagements. It will automatically follow through where the tone of the top is appropriate and where leadership is actually pushing it down to say that quality is non-negotiable and quality is something that you will have to consistently apply across all the engagements. And it is through their actions and behaviors that engagement teams will then demonstrate that they are actually committed to performing a high quality engagement. Yeah, work. Right, so if you were to look at this diagram, this is actually a pictorial rep representation of how ISKM1 talks about the roles and responsibilities around the system of quality management. The ultimate responsibility and accountability for the system of quality management will either be the managing partner or let's say the designated partner or the senior partner of a particular audit firm. That managing partner, designated partner will then have to identify certain set of people based on their knowledge, their experience, their authority in that particular audit firm to perform certain jobs and to take certain responsibilities. So for example, the operational responsibility for the entire system of quality management will need to be assigned specifically and mandatorily required to be assigned to a particular person having the knowledge, influence, and authority to be able to operate the system of quality management. Similarly, operational responsibility will need to be assigned for compliance with independence requirements, compliance with ethical requirements. There will need to be another person who is actually there, who is, has operational responsibility for the entire monitoring and remediation process. And we will talk more on essentially the monitoring and remediation process as well. So this is where the tone at the top, the governance, the leadership, all of that will actually ensure that at least the foundation is laid at the firm level to be able to consistently deliver high quality audits every time that an audit is done by that audit firm. Yeah, Just a quick example on governance and leadership, just to try and illustrate the point of risk and response. So let's say, for example, you have a large firm with multiple offices. Each office may have their own leader, may have their own, own particular person who's designated for, let's say, engagement quality or other operational matters. What could be the risk here? The risk here could be, and this is the quality risk that we are talking about, that because it is such a large firm with multiple offices, will that culture of quality permeate throughout the firm, across offices, across those multiple offices, because the firm is dispersed. So it is the responsibility in this case of the leadership to ensure that this quality risk is responded to and one of the ways in which it could be responded to is have a formal reporting and governance structure to the leadership team. The multiple offices, whoever are the leaders in the multiple offices, there is a formal reporting process and a governance structure which is set up to, to report to a central leadership team. So this is how maybe a large firm could, be able, could permeate the culture of quality across the organization. In a smaller firm, the senior partner or the managing partner may actually be able to directly interact with the personnel of that firm and through that direct interaction may be able to, to communicate what culture is required and the culture quality that is required. And that may be a little easier to do, which is not always possible in a larger firm. So this example also, and, and we, we have a couple of slides later to demonstrate this point more. The standard actually has brought about this concept of scalability. And this slide was just to introduce that concept where depending on the size of the firm, the complexity of the firm, you can actually adapt how you actually implement the system of quality management. And we will talk about that also a little bit more later. Yeah, Varda. So Varda, over to you now to talk about the other few components as well. So uh, I think there is an increased focus or the increased importance on the monitoring and the remediation process. 
Uh, so, uh, if you actually see, there is a there is a requirement that you have uh, an operational responsibility assigned for monitoring and remediation to a particular individual or a set of individuals. Uh, so, so this person will have to be experienced, has the necessary competency, capabilities. Uh, I think one of the key things that he should definitely have is the sufficient time that he is able to spend. Uh, to to look at the 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 monitoring process, uh, someone who can actually look at things objectively, someone with authority who can actually pick up the phone or or uh, work with the other leaders within the firm, so that you can come out with an appropriate uh, remediation uh, to 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 a finding that one may actually have. So uh, the requirement uh, would be to look at the design. Uh, would be to look at the implementation. Uh, would be to look at uh, if there are any uh, uh, any deficiencies which which get uh, identified. Uh, objectively assess, uh, look at, and work with the other uh, uh, partners or or other members within the firm to to remediate any uh, deficiencies uh, one one identifies. The focus that the uh, the ISPM one uh, places is on self identification and on a timely basis. So it is a proactive approach. You identify deficiencies on a on a on a proactive basis and also remediate on a proactive basis. So that it's it's not that there is going to be a third party which is going to come and uh, look at your system of quality management and 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 identify deficiencies. So it has to be something which is proactive and, and it is there as part of your own process. Um, let me, I'll also talk about some of the, the, the aspects that one gets covered as part of this. So the, the monitoring will cover all eight components. Uh, it will also talk will cover the other requirements that I spoke about, including say documentation, assigning uh, appropriate uh, people or, or, or people with authority to different uh, 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 significant uh, 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 activities that needs to get done. Uh, and, and also uh, uh, look at uh, a, a process of establishing ongoing monitoring, right? For instance, uh, uh, you may have a, a consultation process and ongoing monitoring could be that what are the open consultations which are there? So this is something that will probably get uh, evaluated on a more routine basis. Uh, and there is also periodic monitoring uh, where uh, there are personnel who look at uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a more uh, uh, at a point in time basis to see whether there are any aspects that one needs to deal with. Uh, so it could be, as I spoke about consultation, uh, the periodic monitoring could be that whether the consultations are being applied at the engagement level uh, at the in, in the way the consultation was concluded, for instance. So that's another way of looking at it. Uh, there could be ongoing monitoring of, say, for example, you have supervision of audits. Uh, um, so so when you uh, when you have an audit, there is a significant uh, amount of time that's spent on planning, uh, interim audit, and and conclusion, right? So uh, whether there was adequate supervision provided at the time of planning, for instance, can be something that one can monitor uh, to see as to what was the total time spent on monitor uh, on, on, on the planning activity and did the audit partner and the audit engagement manager spend adequate time. So that's that could be another aspect of, of monitoring. Uh, and, and then you have, uh, say, you, you, you have uh, identified a deficiency and you put in processes to remediate, maybe you want to look at those remediation on a more frequent basis. So some of these will determine the nature, timing, and extent of the monitoring activity that you may want to do. Uh, so these are aspects that one may need to plan uh, on, a, on, a, on a more regular basis and keep uh, altering it uh, as, as uh, the situations change. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a it's a pretty important aspect of the entire system of quality management itself, identifying uh, findings and then remediating. The so so this slide talks about 
like when you have a monitoring process, uh, you will end up having findings. Uh, so, so the mind, the findings could come from various sources. Uh, say, for instance, your monitoring activity itself will throw out findings because you are doing a lot of testing uh, as part of the monitoring uh, process. Uh, there could also be, be be findings which may actually come from external inspections, right? So you have NFRA inspecting some of your engagements, or it could be ICAI. Or even if, if if there are inspections that are carried out by any other authority like an RBI or or or, or someone else, uh, so these are all inputs or or findings that you may come across. So you it's important that you consider all sources uh, of of findings when you when you look at your the effectiveness of your system of quality management. There could be other sources as well. For, for instance, you may have allegations or complaints which may be placed by an employee or from a by a client or by anyone else. Right? So these are all sources that one needs to, 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 to look at. Uh, once you have the findings, then you may have to want to, to, to assess whether it, uh, it, it, it is actually a deficiency or not. Uh, so uh, it could be based on, I'm just giving you an example. Say if you have, if, if you can affirm there are 100 engagement or say 1000 engagements that happen and you have uh, archival exceptions in say two instances. Uh, so maybe there is a finding, uh, but whether it is actually a deficiency or not uh, is something that you will need to evaluate. But if it is instead of two, it is 50 or if it is 100, uh, I'm sure there is you, you, your you, you you would actually be forced to think whether there is uh, there is an issue with the way the archival process is functioning, uh, whether uh, all the employees within the firm actually understand what how the archival process has to function, right? So that may probably point towards a deficiency or even a severe deficiency if if the exceptions are way too high, for instance. Uh, so once you have uh, assessed the deficiencies could be in the nature of uh, a proper quality objectives was not properly established, or it could be uh, an aspect around uh, a quality risk was not properly properly identified, or the responses that the, the firm had planned uh, does not really address the, the 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 quality risk that was that was identified. Uh, or it was not designed properly, or the operating effectiveness was probably not there. So, so, so the deficiencies could actually fall in any of these packets. Then you will have to evaluate whether this deficiency is of such a severity, or is it so pervasive uh, that it puts to question uh, whether you are, as a firm, will be in a position to 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 uh, put out. Uh, 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 to, to assert that you have a reasonable system of uh, quality management or not, right? So, so I think I think this is a process which is very similar to the process that you would uh, undertake when you are looking at, uh, say, at, at a client, your uh, uh, internal financial controls. Uh, I think the process is is pretty similar. It's just that it is in relation to the audit firm's own process. Uh, and and one would want to look at things, and of course, once you have a deficiency, one will need to to put in a lot of effort to to figure out as to what is the root cause of it, uh, uh, because getting the root cause right uh, is, is extremely important. You may say that uh, the the root cause is there was not sufficient supervision, for instance, but you may want to understand it better to say that what was the cause of there not being uh, sufficient supervision was it because that the 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 audit uh, personnel were 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 overloaded because you had too many uh, engagements possibly happening at the same time, uh, right? So these are aspects that one will need to look at as as root cause. Come out with a remediation uh, which 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 will be effective. So it's it's very important to get the root cause right to to remediate uh, something. Uh, so this is another example that I had uh, on uh, on on how the process uh, would work. 
say for example you had a quality risk that uh, the file uh, are, are are not archived within within the timeline set up by the firm or by the regulations for instance right so uh, if the uh, in this case the firm used uh, an audit software for documentation of the uh, of of the engagement uh, and uh, the software had a feature where it would send out reminders for archival of engagements uh, when the expect before the expected archival date uh, arrives so so that is the response that the firm had set up uh, uh, but of course it will also have to be monitored the firm uh, then goes on to monitor to say that whether all the engagement files actually got archived within the timelines for instance um, and as part of the the monitoring one actually identified that not all engagements got archived on time within the timelines uh, so there were deviations uh, then one would need to look into uh, the 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 aspect around uh, the uh, how many instances whether you would actually categorize it as a deficiency or not uh, depending upon the 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 number of uh, instances that you actually came across uh, and you may also want to do a root cause uh, of it irrespective of even if there is one file which did not get archived on time you would probably still want to understand uh, the root cause of it uh, and try and assess why did it happen uh, you may come out with a remediation plan of making uh, that you you immediately archive all the open files for instance uh, or it could be uh, getting a, a, an automated process of archival uh, because on the date of the the the, uh, the timeline getting over uh, the the firm may institute a process that uh, the file gets archived on an automatic kind of a basis and you may also want to uh, uh, give out a, a right signal out to the people and you may want to make people accountable who if someone is found responsible for uh, a particular uh, uh, deviation actually happening so you can have uh, an accountability process around any any deficiencies or any findings that you would note so this is one aspect that i thought we can we can talk about uh, and uh, i know we also spoke about communication uh, of uh, of monitoring and remediation uh, as i said when you have a robust uh, monitoring process you will come across uh, instances of findings or deficiencies as part of that uh, so it is important that you are able to to communicate that uh, with the with the with the leadership uh, uh, with with those with the with the individual who has the ultimate responsibility for say the the system of quality management work with other members of the firm who are involved in in handling a particular process so that you can actually come out with a with a remediation uh, plan and 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 roll it out uh, it is also important that the the communication does not remain within just a set of people you may want to uh, have communications with the engagement teams which are going to get impacted uh, say for instance if you have come across an instance where a particular individual was supposed to undergo a particular training and he did not under, undertake that training it is important that you immediately inform uh, in any engagement that he is actually participating so that there can be remediation that can happen even at the engagement level so that maybe there is additional supervision that that happens or someone else uh, carries out the same audit procedure once more so that could be another way of remediating so it's important to take uh, prompt act action so uh, the the communication could be at each engagement level for in of the kind that i spoke about but if there are themes that come out as part of your your monitoring process then you may have to uh, do this communication across the the firm uh to to all the members so that uh, uh for the immediate future they are able to take care of that as as they render their engagements uh the other aspect which i think is, is it's it's also a two way process in the sense that the engagement teams are also part of or or actively contributing to the system of quality management 
Um, in fact, the uh, ISA 220 revise that we spoke about also puts an obligation on the, the engagement teams or individuals part of the engagement teams if they come across an instance uh, where the system of quality management did not really work properly or they want to give some feedback uh, to those operating the system of quality management. Right. Uh, initially, I spoke spoke about as we we we, we undertake uh, a lot of automation as part of the audit. If at an engagement level, one identifies that a particular uh, a tool, which was an IT tool, which did not really function properly, then maybe there is an issue with the tool. Uh, then it becomes an obligation on part of the the engagement team to go back uh, uh, to to those uh, in, in the system who are responsible for that so that that matter can be uh, identified uh, 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 at the at the firm level so it is a two way process the system of quality management people responsible for that communicate with the engagement teams and the engagement teams also have an obligation to feedback uh, to those operating the system of quality management so that the the overall quality of the firm uh, or their engagement improves Um, the, the, the other aspect is also around the evaluation and conclusion. There is a requirement that, uh, that at least each year, at least annually, you, you conclude on, you carry out an evaluation of your system of quality management. Uh, it has to be at a point in time and, but at least, uh, do it, uh, once annually, right? So, uh. I think what you would come across is you will probably follow the same process as you would do in a uh, in a uh, uh, internal financial controls kind of an audit, uh, and you may have to conclude on uh, like you form an opinion on the IFC at a client. You would need to form an opinion uh, on your system of quality management at least annually, uh, right? So you may come across with with two three possible uh, conclusions. Uh, one is where you have reasonable assurance over the 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 system of quality management and that there the the objectives of SQM are being achieved, or that uh, uh, you have certain deficiencies but are not uh, 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 but does not but uh, except for those severe deficiencies you still have a system of quality uh, management that gives uh, a reasonable assurance, or a third. A conclusion that a system of quality management does not provide a reasonable assurance. So you may actually fall in any of these buckets. Uh, uh, so uh, again, it has to be a more objective kind of an evaluation uh, 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 because it 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 also requires that there are uh, uh, communication requirements uh, with with external parties. Uh, so so to that extent, it is extremely important that you have a robust system of uh, quality management. Uh, so I talked about uh, communicating externally. Uh, I know in many of the jurisdictions there is a requirement of having a, a, a transparency report. Uh, so as part of their transparency report or the firm's transparency report, uh, in those uh, territories you will have to 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 uh, to communicate your conclusion on these the. The, the system of quality management, you also need to talk about how your system of quality management uh, supports uh, quality at an engagement level. Uh, this is uh, a, a, a mandatory requirement generally in, in such transparency report requirements. Uh, the the ISKIM 1 also says is that in those uh, instances where no transparency report is actually published, uh, at least with regard to the listed companies uh, that one audits, uh, one needs to have this communication uh, to those charged with governance of those listed companies. So again, it is a mandatory requirement that you talk about your system of quality management and how it supports uh, delivery of your audit, consistent uh, audit quality at an engagement level. Uh, so that's a mandatory requirement that you need to have a, a, a communication with. So this could be as part of your ISA 260 uh, uh, communication with, with those charged with governance. And of course, there could be instances where, where certain external parties will be interested to understand your system of quality management. 
again in those instances you will have to share your 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 assessment and your evaluations so it's extremely important uh, that the the transparency does not remain within the firm but but also outside uh, because there are third parties who are actually interested uh, in in how your system of quality management support uh, your quality audits that you deliver uh, i think i will just briefly talk about scalability uh, uh, that it's the ice cream one is not only for very large firms or mid sized firms it it covers uh, all firms that do uh, provide uh, audit as a service uh, so so uh, in a smaller firm you may have a single person who is responsible for uh, for the 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 overall system of quality management he may also take on the role of operational responsibility of the operating the soqm and he may also take the additional responsibility of doing the the monitoring uh, and the remediation process itself uh, right so so to that extent the the standard is flexible uh, uh, so in a mid sized firm you may have multiple partners multiple levels of leadership uh, so you may give uh, some of these activities to different set of people uh, so that you can actually introduce some level of segregation uh, of duties you can bring in objectivity as 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 the firm grows uh, bigger so in a large firm you may actually have uh, several people who are involved in say say monitoring activities for instance there could be monitoring activity happening at one location uh, there could be different cities out of which the comp the, the firm may be operating uh, there may be different businesses you may have a esg as a separate business business uh, you may have uh, uh, certain non audit assurance delivered uh, from a, as part of a separate business so you may have uh, uh, the 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 uh, the oversight or monitoring app happening at a different level uh, at different places however the standard necessarily requires that there is a single partner who will take the sole responsibility of the system of quality management uh, itself so so that's the requirement of the standard However, it is, as I said, it is flexible. Uh, another example could be of, of scalability could be with regard to the firm's risk assessment process uh, in, a, in a small firm. Uh, maybe where there are very limited set of people who get involved uh, as part of the risk assessment process. The documentation may be uh, less extensive than in a very a uh, large firm in a complex firm which in, which is into different uh, uh, business segments for instance uh, uh, however in a larger firm there may be multiple levels uh, in fact the, the one person may not even have a full view of all the clients that one has or or uh, all uh, the kind of engagement that that is actually getting rendered uh, in which case you may actually have a decentralized Kind of a process which 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 actually feeds in uh, the risk assessment uh, for at, so that it can be evaluated at, on an overall kind of a basis uh, i think with that uh, i think i've more or less covered what the 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 requirements of these standards are uh, i think as a, as a key reminder all that i would want to put out is that uh, that it is it is compliance based approach uh, uh, the is sqc1 was compliance based uh, the isqm1 is 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 uh, is risk based uh, the expectation is that it, uh, the firm operates in a in a proactive manner identifies risks addresses those risks in a in a timely manner uh, uh, so that uh, there is a culture of of quality that gets created uh, and as I said, uh, it's not limited to a set of people, but everyone within the firm contributes towards the system of quality management. Uh, and, and, and of course, uh, transparency, robust communication is, is the other aspect uh, that's, uh, that's important. Um, I think only a, a, a small piece of, of, of uh, uh, input to someone who is trying to put together uh, 
uh, a new ISQM1 implementation, please do not underestimate the time that it requires. Uh, it, it actually requires an enormous amount of time, but that doesn't mean that you should be afraid of uh, getting into this journey because it's a once you get into this journey, you actually get hooked onto it. Uh, you want to do better and better. Uh, uh, as I said, try and identify as many deficiencies as possible so that that's the best way that you actually try and remediate uh, some of these as you as you go along. Uh, yeah, I think there are a few other resources that are available if anyone uh, is, is interested. Uh, IASB has a few uh, webinars. Uh, these are available. Uh, it picks up certain specific topics. Uh, say risk assessment, for instance, uh, monitoring remediation, for instance. So these are all available. So anyone interested uh, to have a deep dive in any of these specific areas, uh, this is available. Um, and of course, you now have QC 1000, which is very recently be, being announced. Uh, so it's it's applicable for all firms that uh, that are registered with PCAOB and contribute towards a PCOB audit. Uh, so I think more or less based on uh, ISQM1, but there are uh, a, a few incremental requirements that the firms will have to consider. Um, so with that, I come to an uh, end. I'm happy to, to take any questions uh, 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 as and when anyone has anyone, anything. So back to you, Mr. Tonk. Yeah, please go ahead if anyone has any questions so that our different faculty can take up. If participants have any questions, you can uh, just post them on the chat box. So I, I see a question uh, to say, is there a software that we can use to ensure compliance? Um, so we don't really necessarily have any software which is available. Uh, I know each uh, uh, firm's system of quality management may be different. Uh, uh, as we also said that from moving away from a compliance-based approach, which may have a list of compliances to be ensured, uh, but when it comes to a system of quality management, uh, it's it's about what is the risk that the firm perceives as a risk that they have, uh, and they may want to uh, have a, an appropriate response uh, with regard to that. Uh, I think uh, we also talk about, spoke about documentation, for instance. That is something that you can even do your documentation of of all of this in in your the way that you do it for your engagement files you can set up a file uh, you can have populate what procedures that you want to carry out you can document your risk assessment uh, but but there is no specific uh, software which is available it can be whatever that you use for your own engagement So if there are no more questions, can we uh, proceed ahead? Yeah, there's one more. Okay. Specifically in the Indian scenario, wherein the appointment in listed companies is with management of the company. Yeah. yeah uh, so, Avitesh, you can take this question, I think, sir. Yeah, so I think yes, the the appointment, the 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 technically the appointment is by the shareholders, right? It is not by the management. Yes, the management may recommend a particular auditor, but I think independence is far greater than that, right? If we are talking about independence from management, there are specific independence standards, there are specific ethical standards. 
I think that goes to the core of being a professional. At the end of the day, just because, let's say practically, management is making the recommendation to appoint somebody as an auditor, and yes, the shareholders will approve it. Does that really mean that your independence, your you have an independence conflict or your independence is vitiated? I don't believe so because ultimately, at the end of the day, if I have to render a quality audit. I know that there are certain independent standards that I will have to adhere to. I know that there are certain ethical standards that I will need to adhere to, and that does not change regardless of who has appointed me. And I think that is really what ISQM1 is also talking about. It is talking about that behavior. It is talking about that culture. It is also talking about that professional skepticism and the professional attitude that one needs to show as a, as a high quality auditor to maintain your independence, regardless of who has actually appointed you. That's how I would actually say it, Kulkarniji. And the next question is also interesting. Uh, is, there, is there any rating model provided? Uh, I guess uh, rating of the audit firms, you know, uh, they, I think probably that's what they're uh, intending at that. Um, uh, maybe, you know, you are expert that uh, you know, quality maturity model and many other things are happening. Uh, is that what you know? You know uh, uh, otherwise, from the regulator's perspective, there is no as of now any rating model. You know, which is there. nowhere. I I think uh, uh, that kind of model exists. Um, other than in some jurisdictions like India, we have uh, empanelment uh, based some uh, you know the. Uh, resource availability, etc. Some uh, rank ordering of the firms is done, uh, but otherwise something like um, uh, you know the credit rating agency is giving uh, a rating to the you know corporate etc. Uh, uh, we have not seen any such rating. But um, and Rajan, if you have any thoughts on this, you can you know also share with you on that. Yeah, there is no uh, rating uh, as such. Uh, there are no rating agencies or or there is no model which is available again i think one needs to be 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 aware and that the 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 system of quality management will flow along with uh, with uh, with what the the firm does right say for example if there is a there is a there is a tax firm which is primarily involved in rendering tax services maybe isqm1 does not even apply because you don't have if you don't provide assurance services outside, then the the quality standard does not really apply. You need to have a proper assessment or or risk management, uh, risk assessment, and put all these uh, aspects with regard to the uh, uh, to the services that you render uh, to put out your your audit opinion, right? So uh, the entire standard is is focused on that. So, if you do an audit of uh, of very large clients, then you may have to have a uh, more elaborate uh, system of quality management, which should uh, try and uh, be be responsive to the nature of work that you do. If you do simple audits, your system of quality management will also be simple, but then it is it is as robust as as you can say that your audit work will meet the 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 requirements uh, of uh, the isqm1 because that's the level of service that you are actually rendering um, and and we also spoke about scalability right for a for a smaller firm you may have a simple system of quality management for a, as you grow larger you will need to necessarily have things do get complex because of the number of people that get involved uh, making sure that the culture of the firm is same across thousands of people is is that much more difficult than uh, making sure that it it remains so in a in a smaller set of people. So it has to be looked at from that perspective. So I think uh, we uh, stop here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, C. Amitesh. Shataji and Vandarajini for a very comprehensive presentation and for taking the questions as well. You know, they, these uh, have, uh, I hope uh, the participants would have you know, benefited uh, and, and 
will will as a takeaway, you know, uh, uh, the uh, I I want to say that you know the better understanding and acceptance of the ISQM and and uh, those of uh, other standards also, which uh, chairperson has you know highlighted for uh, adopting in the Indian framework. Uh, I take this opportunity to, you know, thank uh, our executive body and especially our chairperson for uh, setting the tone, tone and also driving home the importance of, you know, adopting the international standards, right? We discussed elaborately. And also for, uh, you know, guiding us in steering the sea level. Uh, we praise our sincere thanks for our full time members for sparing their uh, time and joining us. That goes to show. You know how important uh, this webinar has been for uh, us here at NAPRA. Uh, thank you, uh, member sir and member ma'am, for sharing your, their, their views. And so we also would like to thank our secretary, Ms. Rusu, for her contribution in the conduct of this webinar. Uh, we take uh, you know great privilege uh, in expressing our sincere gratitude to our eminent speakers, uh, Mitesh Dattaji and Vardarajindi. Uh, we really appreciate, we recognize uh, the uh, passion that you have for sharing the knowledge and, and, and you know, uh, your commitment uh, for sharing the knowledge uh, as always, because uh, last year also you were with us. And uh, we. Of course, to the team which uh, supported you as well, uh, I'm sure that that will be, you know, few others also have contributed in there. So, thanks to them as well. So, yeah. Your uh, gracious, uh, you know, uh, sharing of your expertise as, as uh, I believe, enrich our uh, participants also. Thank you very much, both of you, for that. And uh, we also uh, are thankful to our NAFRA and MCA technical teams. You know, they have been working for putting up this webinar. We thank them. And uh, I also would like to take this opportunity to thank my esteemed colleague, uh, our principal consultant, Mr. Vijayadar Kulkarni, for, uh, you know, giving his valuable contribution for the conduct of this webinar. So we look forward to continuing this journey of knowledge sharing and professional growth. We uh, take this opportunity to, uh, you know, thank our esteemed participants for joining us today. You know, uh, and uh, they have added value to our you know, uh, webinar and to this uh, learning journey. Uh, we request uh, the participants to look out for our announcement for uh, coming webinars. And uh, I also, yeah, I also uh, reiterate the request, you know, put out today in our webinar of responding to the exposure draft that has been put up on uh, NAPRA website. So I request uh, all the stakeholders to uh, kindly uh, respond before 31st of uh, October. And uh, I once again thank all of you for joining us today in this webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.